everyone. Thank you again for coming today. Um, I hope like the email you got didn't look, it looked a little differently because we're using a different format for setting up the emails. So um, I'm glad you guys didn't think it was spam. <laughs> um, but um, today we're, um, our guest speaker is um, Jolyn Shoemaker. And um, so before we start with introductions for her, can we go around the room and just everyone just kind of say their name and um, what you're studying and what your interests are. Um, hi, I'm Paulina Carmona. I'm a postdoc uh, at Neurology Department. Um, I'm interested in seminar because I also belong to nonprofit organizations um, regarding global affairs, especially for science diplomacy. So I'm a graduate student in the Department of Political Science, and I'm interested in the Center for Diasporas and their capacity to impact. My name is Aaron I'm, I'm a graduate student from the Department of Sciences, so I'm, I'm interested with global affairs and how things work. Hi, my name is Brian. I'm a graduate student from School of Education, and I'm interested in effects of musical training on language acquisition. Hi, I'm Irina from the Department of Communication. I'm a second year PhD student interested in media effects on crowd. Hi, I'm, oh, sorry. I'm uh, Dana Armstrong. I'm a master's student in international ag development. Uh, I'm here because I'm interested in kind of the international affairs of higher education institutions. I'm Karen. I'm a third year in epidemiology PhD, and I am interested in like broadening my horizons of like what potential careers there are afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I'm Nikki, third year PhD student from the Agricultural and Resource Economics Department. Um, and I'm just here to get more like, outside experience. I'm Emily Roberts. I'm a second year master's student in nutrition biology. I'm graduating this year, and uh, my interests are in public health and chronic disease prevention. So um, we're going to start off, um, if you attended Nancy's the last session, we're going to do things a little bit similarly, but we'll start out with some questions, but feel free to chime in if you have any questions of your own to ask, um, and then we'll open up the floor at the end to um, anybody that wants to ask questions. So um, first of all, um, if Jolene, can you tell us more about your professional background and um, also your title here at Global Affairs? Okay, sure. So I, I I guess I'm a little bit of a, like a square peg in a round hole or whatever you call it, um, because I don't I don't I'm pretty new to higher education um, in terms of career path. So um, I've sort of taken a very different route. Um, I spent almost 20 years in Washington D.C. Um, both in policy making roles. Um, I'm also a lawyer, so legal roles, um, and in um, working on policy advocacy um, within Washington, D.C. as well, um, in the foreign policy arena. And um, I am originally from California, so I um, really wanted to come back to California, and uh, for various reasons, my husband and I ended up in, in this area, um, and um, he's also a Washington, D.C. person who spent a long time on Capitol Hill. Um, and so uh, I primarily wanted to see if I could stay in the international sector, even though there's not quite as much out here. And that led me here to UC Davis, and um, it's sort of been a learning, it, it's been a learning curve for me just coming out of other types of sectors working on international affairs into more of an academic um, academic environment. Um, so in terms of when I started out, I, I ended up getting my master's and my law degree 
um, simultaneously. Um, and I moved from California to, to DC to do that um, because I really wanted to work in foreign policy. So I started out at State Department working on um, human rights uh, and um, and then I worked in um, the Department of Defense in the Office of the Secretary of Defense in a couple of capacities. Um, and then at that time I really, and this is one thing that we, we can certainly talk about if you all are interested, I, we, I really felt that um, the culture of uh, an executive agency, a large executive agency, wasn't exactly the organizational culture that I felt I could thrive in or wanted to wanted to stay in. Um, it was really important for me um, in terms of foreign policy credentials to have that experience, but I was really drawn to the NGO sector. So that's when I um, left and ended up working um, in the NGO sector for quite a while. Um, so my title here is uh, Director of Global Engagements, and I can, can talk now or later about some of what that entails. Um, and um, and so, yeah, so it sounds like a lot of you might be interested in the higher education part and maybe the NGO part. So anyway, we can, like Janice said, feel free to make this a conversation. There's not too many of us, so we can, you know, at any time, let us know if you if, you know if you have questions about anything. So I guess I'll we'll start with that, and then we can get into some of this stuff. Yeah, sure. Um, so I think you briefly mentioned your decision to enter policy making and working with NGOs. Could you elaborate a little bit? More? Yeah, yeah, sure. So, so uh, when I started out my career in government, and that you know, it's a really great. Um, opportunity to sort of see what goes into creating policy um, and sort of dispelling, I think, some of the assumptions that we have about how policy is made um, and understanding the players and sort of the trade-offs that go into what we see come out on the other end in terms of policy. Um, so I was really appreciative to have that experience, but what I but it's constraining at the same time, right? So um, for our for the U.S. government, obviously we all know a little bit about you know the administration changes and how that and now we, we know on the Trump administration, you know, sort of how that's the many issues that that have come out. Um, when I started. Uh, in government, I started out in the, I was a civil servant, so in other words, the idea of coming into government as a civil servant is that you are not a political appointee, right? There's a difference. So political appointees come in and they're appointed by the administration in power and they have a political leaning, right? Their, their agenda is to support the political um, goals of that administration. Civil servants uh, are intended to stay and be nonpartisan, right? So they stay throughout multiple administrations. Um, and then and then there's another category, which is foreign service, which is, is, is a sort of our, our pool of people who go from country to country and um, represent the United States. Um, so when I started out, I started out in the Clinton administration, and then I, I experienced the transition to the Bush administration. Um, and, you know, that was also one of my factors for leaving government. It wasn't the only thing, um, because as a civil servant, you definitely need to be able to roll with whatever the political agenda is of, of your political bosses. Um, and, um, and, you know, you've seen some departures under this administration because of that, too. So that it does happen for sure. I think it's a little bit more extreme right now than we usually see. Um, so I was feeling a bit constrained because in, in my graduate studies and in, in, my, uh, in my law school studies, I had really focused on human rights, but I had also focused on violent conflict and peace and security and how those issues get resolved. And, um, and what I found myself doing in government was being very constrained about how we were looking at peace and conflict. Um, and I, when I left, I was in the, um, in the office of the Secretary of Defense, and it, it, it was almost the, the, the viewpoint on what we needed to look at 
um, and was very um, narrow. Um, and so I was very interested in the human factor, right? Human security. Why aren't we paying attention to what's happening to the people on the ground and things like that? And so I was feeling very frustrated in that environment. Um, and that ultimately led me to start looking at the non-governmental sector. And um, I ended up leaving to go work for an organization um, that was really trying to promote um, the participation of civil society and um, women in uh, decisions about war and peace. Um, and I had become really interested in this through my graduate research and, um, and ended up publishing uh, some journal articles as well at the undergraduate school on these issues. And so I was really intrigued with the idea of, now could I do more outside of the system than inside the system? Right? There's pros and cons. Um, we need, you need champions that are trying to push inside the system to change it for the better. Um, but we also need the outside push, right? That's kind of how it works. So, um, so I wanted to see what I could do on the outside. Um, and um, it was a really interesting because this was a, a time when um, there was a UN resolution um, from the, uh, on women, peace, and security that had passed uh, unanimously in the year 2000. Um, and really, policy people were unaware and trying to sort of figure out how their regular way of doing things was proving inadequate in many ways on women, on, on, on peace and security. And so how would they potentially integrate uh, this, this new agenda that was coming out of the UN? And there was very, very little awareness in Washington of this. So, when I came out of government and started working on advocacy, we were basically, a group of us were advocating, a group of civil society organizations was advocating for the US government to change the way it does business around foreign policy and national security in a really fundamental way, uh, which is bringing civil society uh, voices and perspectives and recommendations to the table directly. Um, and it was very much an uphill battle. It still is. Um, and, uh, but at the same time, we felt like we could change uh, the way things are done and we could ultimately transform, be transformative and change, change, um, change uh, you know, the, the, the stability for the, for the, for the better um, in many places. So it, I think for me, it was really feeling that I was working towards a mission that I could really believe in and then bring, and then we did all kinds of things during those early years where we were developing case studies to build up the evidence and we can talk more about evidence-based policy making um, and how important it is. So how we need people with these analytical abilities and these different expertise to come in and be able to build build that body of knowledge so that policy makers can make better decisions. So we were building a lot of that of that knowledge uh, from the ground up and uh, trying to bring it together in ways that policy makers would be able to um, not only react positively towards it, so there was a persuasive piece of it, but also then take the recommendations and be able to integrate them in what they were doing. So that's a whole nother, and I'd be happy to talk to you guys if you're interested about how that policy advocacy process really works for NGOs trying to influence policy making. But I did that for a number of years and then I ended up um, leading a non-governmental organization of about 7,000 members around the world that was based in Washington, D.C. called Women in International uh, Security. Um, and so we were really, again, trying to push um, trying to push a gender lens into our peace and security uh, dialogue in Washington, D.C. and into our decision making and really promote the participation of women and support them and nurture them um, and, and try to change a little bit of the picture that is so skewed in terms of our top level of national security and foreign policy and women's represent, underrepresentation. So I did that for a number of years and then um, I did a few years of independent consulting for a variety of NGOs and that was really fun and then I moved out here. And um, interesting, like I think a lot of people also, this is a kind of an interesting trend that I've seen, 
people kind of wear multiple hats, right? And so I work here on global strategy and that kind of thing, but I also continue to work on women, peace, and security as an independent consultant on the side. Um, and so that's sometimes works. <laughs> it does depend on what time and how much time you have in a day. Um, yeah, so um, so that's that. Do you, do you want me to talk about global affairs or do you have other questions? Uh, oh, you had other questions, I think, on the NGO side. Yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll wait for the global affairs okay. Okay. in a little bit. But um, I think more concentrating what like students might be interested in about like the career mm -hmm. field of like mm -hmm. working in policy making with NGOs. Um, is this like a field that's really primarily relevant to those in social sciences and humanities, or is this also relevant to those working in STEM fields and how can you probably those that those skill sets into working yeah. in this sort of you know? Yeah, I mean absolutely. I mean it's 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 a vast there's a vast ecosystem, right, that, that involves policy making. You know, as I said, you can be on the inside of various institutions, you know, not limited to governments, right? right? You know, we have the UN, we have all kinds of international and regional bodies and so forth. Um, there's the NGO side, there's the other nonprofit side is think tanks. So there's a there's just this there's a ecosystem in place where there's you know the decision making bodies the bodies that are making policy and then there's there's influencers as we call them on the outside that are constantly influencing and and the expertise uh, needs to come on all from all these disciplines right because um, you know I mean climate change is a perfect example of that right we need the science to come to the tables to influence how we're, how we're dealing with the problems at hand. Um, we need the social sciences, you know, at the table as well. Um, so it policy making, I wouldn't say there, there's not a single discipline um, or research topic that you're studying that I would, would be disconnected from policy making. All of it has relevance um, and we, we need more people who are involved in policy making who are who have a deep knowledge of these these disciplines because oftentimes what happens in in the in that ecosystem is that we tend to get um, in many ways we we do tend to get groupthink because of the the career paths that are that are created and some of the paths that are funneling in so for example you know. A large proportion of people who you will meet at State Department, for instance, you know, were international affairs, international relations uh, masters, right? They went through those, you know, a number of known schools for that, right? And so they're coming in with maybe like a, a broader sense of international affairs and some sense of theory and so forth. But then once we start to get into the issues that are on the table and the challenges yeah we need people to move forward the policy and know how to do that but we also need people who bring the expertise to the table so that we're formulating recommendations or policy itself that is based on knowing things right and i mean i, I kind of laugh when i say that right now because we're having so many issues in this country around facts and so forth but but we, when I was when I was uh, in Washington on the policy advocacy side, we were just starting. We were just starting to talk about evidence based policy making, right? So this was a, a fairly new concept um, for for a long time. I mean, policy making, at least in the international field, was kind of functioning almost as a insider outsider club, right? The club, you know, the club was oftentimes populated by people who were coming from a few schools who were connected with each other, you know, and that perpetuates, right, ways of thinking that aren't necessarily getting us to the, to the, to um, unpacking and solving the challenges that we need to, that we're facing. And increasingly, in terms of making the trade-offs, because there's always trade-offs in policy making, you're always you're always weakening something else or making a choice to minimize something else when you choose a policy direction. Um, to, in order to really make a more make more rational choices around that, people were starting to discuss evidence, right? Where's the evidence for, you know, that, that will, and, and 
And I would say from, from my experience, the Obama administration almost had a like fixation with this. In, in many senses, the Obama administration oftentimes was very slow to act on things because they spent so much time internally weighing this, weighing that evidence, weighing that data, 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 where it was almost like they were crippled sometimes on actually making decisions. Um, but on the other hand, well, then we have the other side, which is nothing's informed by evidence or facts. So, you know, we're, we're in this period of extremes. Um, but definitely, you know, when I was in Washington, you know, one of the, one of the, some of the people that really had this tremendous effect and were very, um, were very credible were uh, known as the triple A, triple AS bells, the triple AS, uh, I can't remember. But it's the yeah, right the science fellows, um, and you know so those fellows were often embedded in State Department, and so there was much more of I think a trend of sort of saying we need to bring people with these various deep these deep knowledge in these fields to the table and start to bridge it so that we are actually creating more informed policy. So that's a long way of saying I think we are. Still very much, I think the policy community is still grappling with that, and we're in a period where the pendulum has swung the other way, but I can guarantee you it's not going to stay over there. Um, because the trend towards evidence-based policymaking and bringing in experts and, and, you know, and being able to make better choices is, is stronger than what's going on right now. So it will, the pendulum has swung to the extreme with it, but it will start to come back again. Um, so in terms of career paths for all you, I think if you have an interest in policy and engaging in policy, we need every single one of you, what you described as your disciplines. I mean, every single one of those disciplines is relevant and you have ways that you can contribute directly or indirectly to policy. So I'd be, I'd be happy to answer more questions. That's kind of a general answer. Okay. Does anyone have any questions they want to ask at this point? Yeah. I came early, so I kind of overheard your conversation about children, and I apologize, but no the question is regarding that. Yeah. So, usually when um, I'm reading about advice on how to, um, like, how to even start working for nonprofits, mm -hmm. usually the first advice is always regarding an internship. Mm -hmm. But as a grad student who has children, yeah. um, I can't seem to find time for that. Yeah. Especially um, since I don't drive, so it's really hard to yeah. go places and come back. So is there any other way <laughs> or or this is like the best thing to do to jumpstart? It depends on a, few, a couple of things. I think it's the general, like people always start there. That's always the starting point that they that they think of. You know, I, I do think there are other routes for sure, um, and it kind of depends on whether you're talking about here or you're talking about Washington or you're talking about location matters too, right? Because if you're talking about where you are now, it gives you an advantage because you can do the networking. When people are talking about starting out in Washington and they're coming from here. You almost have to build your credibility. You know, you have to start, you have to, it's hard not to start with the internship because you have to kind of you know, build it that way. I think that if you're talking more about local, local or regional, if you can start doing your, if you can, and networking is really hard with kids because it tends to be off hours, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so that's also about lunches, coffees, things like that. Um, I think you're, that's an advantage um, where you can start to build a professional network. And, you know, so this is the thing. I mean, I wouldn't ever underesti underestimate the power of trying to meet people sooner rather than later that are doing things that you're interested in or are working for organizations you're interested in. Um, obviously, most of my professional experience is in D.C., but there, I mean, everyone started out at some point 
And so I think there was a real feeling towards mentoring and at least talking to people who are starting into the field and sharing experiences and so forth. The, 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 main, the main issue people have is just time, you know, they're busy. But I think if you can start to develop, the sooner you can start to develop your professional network, the better, and you can do it without doing an internship. You can actually do it um, and with the, I mean, LinkedIn is a great example. Like you can use LinkedIn paired with coffee meetings or whatever, where you can reach out and, you know, try to do informational meetings or, you know, short 30 minute call or this or that, you know, hey, I'm a, this is what I'm studying. This is really aligned with where I want to go. It looks like what you do is, you know, very interesting and aligned with what I'd like to do. I'd love to, you know, talk to you about what you see, you know, in terms of the, the landscape and the opportunities and, you know, so forth for 30 minutes of your time. Either I'd love to buy you a cup of coffee or, you know, we could do it over the phone, like give people choices, you know, make it really short, make it really easy. Once you make that connection, then you connect with them on LinkedIn and you're building your, you know, you're starting to build your network and you can utilize then that that's the great thing about I use LinkedIn as my Rolodex. That's what I use it for. But it's also, you know, if you have something that you're say you're doing a paper or you did a paper on some issue, you can you can share that on there or share a summary or comment on something else that's connected with it. You're starting to build visibility around that you have expertise to share. So there's a number of ways to do it. And I think in many ways, the social media platforms really help us do that where they weren't there before. Um, certainly internships can help, but you know, it, I think if you, you can also package your research and other, any other experience that you're having within your graduate degree curriculum, you can repackage that in many ways. So it just depends, you know, you can also leverage what you're doing to get yourself out there as an expert. Like for example, and this gets more into like bridging academia and policy, but one of the really effective things you can do is you can take something that you've researched and you are an expert on it and then figure out is there some is there some issue with this that people need to know and write an op-ed. And there's multiple venues or platforms for this now. You can, you know, there's there's multiple ways to get something published or to self-publish. And then you're sharing it. So there there's different ways, I think, to kind of start to show, you know, some of that in a way where you're not necessarily doing the internship. Um, but you have to be, I think, a little bit entrepreneurial around it and a little bit creative and kind of try things and so forth because ultimately I mean ultimately with internships it's not about what you're learn I think what this is my own personal opinion I think what you learn in internships what you're learning in terms of how to do something whatever your task with doing for that internship is secondary what you're doing really is building the relationships professionally because the idea for internships is how they help you is that basically you take that internship and whoever you've worked with before that internship and you then use that use that relationship to get to the next thing. Um, and so I think that you, there's other ways to build those relationships certainly. Um, I mean, in this area, we don't have as many events going on. One thing that we did in DC, because there were always, a, there was always an event, like once a week, any of you who are studying whatever you're studying, once a week there was something relevant to you in DC. There was a public free event, like it was constant. And so you could go to those things and kind of meet other people and things like that. So there were other channels, you know, to do. But I think, yeah, it just, I think there's so many ways to get your voice and expertise and interests out there that weren't there before that just thinking a little bit about that and I've seen people do it really effectively. Um, and, you know, if you publish, great. But then translate, if it's highly academic, you have to translate the gist of that to make it so that people will make the connection with what they're doing. One of the things I always recommend people do is kind of a stakeholder mapping. 
So like if you want to stay in this area or you want to go to DC or whatever and you're interested in these issues is to start to identify the organizations that could potentially be touching those issues. You know, and you kind of map it. You start to map it out and then you start and then because we have this great resource of the internet, you can start to identify who's there. And I think it's much more effective to go sort of find the people if you can and connect with the people themselves that have a common substantive interest to you rather than just applying, right? Because it's going to HR and that's a different thing. So if you build it that way. So I don't know if that's too many things, not enough, or if that's helpful at all, but I wouldn't get totally discouraged that you're limited on the internship. I think there's other ways to get there. Yeah. Uh, do you mind if I add a little bit? No, yeah, go ahead, please. Uh, you are a PhD student. Uh, I did the future program, and you actually nicely summarized the whole quarter of future in your answer with all the networking. Uh, they give you, for example, like I did it um, in fall, and they put me in contact with two people for information and interviews. So they give you all those tools for networking and preparing all your social media platforms and everything mm -hmm. or I've whatever heard that you want. Before, but I, can. I recommend that. It, it was really useful. And yeah, actually what you said is like the whole, what they work in the throw the quarter for whatever you are interested. And and if I can talk a little bit from my own experience, um, I am a lab person that all of a sudden I started to be involved in a nonprofit and the way I did it uh, I just uh, found one that it is not based anywhere. It's just a virtual team, and I started as a mentor for Latin empowerment and professional development online, just email. But I also have a son, so it was a night work. It was replying emails at night and everything. But it, it paid off because then I had a lot of ideas, and then they were like, "Oh, can you be the representative for North and Central America then?" And then I started to put those ideas in motion, but always virtually. I don't have to go anywhere. It's just my ideas, my emails, and the starting contacting people. And then that opened the door for me to apply to another international organization. And I got in there because I, I built a, this little piece just by email. So I think yeah, it is possible with internet. Yeah, that's yeah, amazing. Because some energy. <laughs> there's so much remote stuff happening now, for sure. Yeah. And I think it's a great opportunity. And I think that's the other point. It's like sometimes when we're starting on our path, we don't think we can be we can be mentoring others. And 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 many organizations desperately need that too. Um, and we all have that. And you <laughs> have the ability to do it. So that's a very that's a great way that then you were and you knew, you knew things that they needed, they needed that expertise on top of your other expertise. So that's really, yeah, so I think it's just, it's sort of like, I think the, the old ways of doing things are sort of, you know, they're kind of breaking apart, but like we're in this messy period where, you, you know, it used to be like, you do But again, I think it's all breaking down now, um, and and there are multiple routes uh, people have, and and I think also, I mean that's the other thing. Even my later years in Washington, seeing people coming from very different backgrounds in terms of their disciplines participating in these processes and and bringing that to the table was really good. It's a really good thing, you know. So I think we're sort of living through this, and so yeah. So you have to kind of, I think, think, what am I passionate about? That's probably what led you there, you know. Like I'm passionate about, you know, I could help, you know, and then it also helps you too. So there's a there's that piece of it. So yeah. So you kind of have to kind of you know look at what's outside. Look at you know sort of just spend some time thinking. Hmm, Okay, where could I where could I start building and just start with the baby steps? Yeah. Oh, she, has, she had a question first. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's gonna take us in a slightly different direction. So. Okay. <laughs> um, you kind of covered it a little bit already. You touched on it. Um, but as you know, a, a graduate student, I sometimes have to struggle with, you know, I care about things and want to make a difference, but what I really need to focus my time and energy on is a dissertation 
getting published, yeah. doing research. Yeah. So how does an academic researcher, especially a grad student, that really has to publish things, that really has to write a dissertation and is expected to do so in a certain way, yeah. um, how does that researcher make their findings accessible but also seen by policymakers? Yeah. And also do so without you know putting themselves in a position where you know getting published in a journal article is very difficult. Like if I'm trying to do that, but I have findings that I want policymakers to see, yeah. do I just also you know make them? Do I also apply to op eds before I've gotten into right. a journal? So right. it's this yeah 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 it's kind of this ethical Chicken. issue, yeah, yeah, but, but also this really important logistical challenge. Yeah yeah I understand. And I mean it's just such a it's such a big issue, right? Because I think that it carries through, like, you know, I mean, professors, I've been in conversations here, you know, where it's like the incentive structure, it, there's such disincentives to doing things in a way where you're actually going to be able to engage with policy and you're going to be able to influence it, and that all needs to be addressed, right? But you're, you're feeling it on, you know, one side of that, for sure. And I think it's really difficult. I mean, I, I just to tell a little brief story because it reminded me of this. So I have a, a good friend in the Monterey area who um, is doing her PhD as well, her dissertation, and um, she's doing it on gender. It's a it's related to gender and peace and security, and and she, but she's also she was also leading a chapter voluntarily for this organization I used to run in DC and. And so she, it was really difficult for that same reason because she started to learn so much just from engaging with the policy people. She started to learn what the issues, a lot of the issues, and then she was trying to bring them into her dissertation research and she was getting slapped down like all the time, right? Because it wasn't done in that way. So uh, she was really struggling in that and just to, like where she is now, she's on the city council and she's still doing it, she's finishing her dissertation. So there's a way to do it, for sure. Um, I would say, I mean, so the, the op-ed issue, I think could be tricky for the reasons that you outlined. You know, I think you kind of need to have that credibility, you know, in place before you're out with your opinions, right? That, that may just be a sequencing issue. So maybe that's not necessarily the right route, but maybe there's something in between of, of identifying perhaps, um, perhaps organizations or advocacy efforts that tie in with your research or you know, would benefit from that what you know and they don't know um because that's the problem a lot of times with like advocacy uh platforms or advocacy efforts is they're very surface level right and so because people who do that don't have the time to do the district you know they're not they're not doing the deeper research um so unless you can kind of come come to them with it so that could potentially and I just don't know in terms of like your issue areas and things like that, but that could potentially maybe finding are there movements or you know organizations or um, is there is there some sort of advocacy movement that's happening that needs this information or would benefit from it, and then maybe approaching through that way, um, you know, kind of along the lines of you know. I'm thinking of your example of sort of saying, you know, could I be a resource, you know, because my intention is to make sure that the research that I'm doing actually can benefit these other things. And then maybe there's a way to ultimately work on policy papers or, you know, I mean, you just don't know where things are going to lead when you have the initial conversation. And I think sometimes it's useful to just try to open the door a little bit and see where it leads. But that could be a first way to kind of get involved in the advocacy side in a more of like a sort of a, an expert kind of way, right? Um, and I mean, depending on NGOs and things like that, when I 
my my experience is we usually if like people came to us with real expertise which usually like immediately have it something in mind that they could you know that they could this isn't like an internship of like running errands like you, you know oh i have a grad student here a phd student who actually knows this maybe you could help us by looking at this policy brief we're drafting like is this right is this tracking with the research right you know so i think just we're on this i think we're on this cusp right now of figuring out how the academic and the how we can relate more and, and 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 contribute more but i don't know maybe that's maybe that's one you'll get to the op-ed but maybe wait till you get the journal and then you know branch off of there yeah so, yeah, what, what I mean? question? Yeah, I was about that, but so the person put so the sorry, I think she Yeah. Um so I was just you talked a little bit about like the outside and inside like outside of the NGO and so like actually working for the government. So I was wondering what you think you actually were able to more of a change and kind of along that lines, um when you were working for um, state government, um, how did you first start finding the NGOs that you wanted to work for? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think it's a challenge, like wherever you sit, it's a challenge to like step out of that, right? Yeah. And know what the landscape is. Because who has, you know, we, we're all limited on the time we have, right? Mm -hmm. And and a lot of this insight is gained from actually just like operating in these sectors, you know, the who's who are the who are the players who are doing what. So it's sometimes really hard mm -hmm. from the outside. Um, so a couple of thoughts. I mean, I, I think that like when I worked in government, um, the way I the way I made the jump to the NGO sector was in many ways like kind of kind of random in the, in the sense that what, what happened with me is that um, I was working at the Pentagon for my master's. At the end of my master's and all that, I had focused on, started focusing on women, peace, and security. And I was frustrated because when I went to the Pentagon, I actually had this idea that, like, we were, all of us were on the same page in terms of government priorities and so forth anyway there's all this infighting and, and and so forth and and i was and so i started looking out at what was going on and this was like i mean this is part of dc there's just like as i was mentioning there's tons of events all the time so i started like one thing i started doing there which wouldn't i guess it could work a little bit here if you found the organizations that do do events and so forth but there there's so many and so i just i got on all the mailing lists or all the listservs for all the um think tanks and things like that and so what ended up happening out of that is that the organization i ended up going to work for was um they were doing all this research they were doing these case studies um on different country different contexts and what had happened with peace processes and how um, in many cases women had been really involved and then were kind of cut out at different points or they were included in something positive happened so they were kind of trying to document a lot of this kind of invisible stuff that had been done and so they were going around washington and presenting these case studies and so i happened to find out about the organization because they were kind of doing this little rope, this kind of, you know, just this kind of uh, around the major think tanks in DC. They were presenting like their El Salvador case at the OAS, and the, you know, they so they were presenting at the various involved um, involved institutions. And so I start, I, I went to a couple of the events, and I just went afterwards up to them, and I introduced myself, and I said, hey. You know, I'm working, this is what I'm doing now, but I, in my master's program, I was really focused on this, and I want to get back into it, or I want to find some route to be able to do that. And, and, and so I met a couple of people through these things, and I kind of kept in touch. And then out of the blue, someone from that organization called me like a number of months later and said, you know, 
we actually need someone who knows how the Pentagon works and State Department works and knows something about this issue so that would you be interested in come work for us and do advocacy. So I said, oh, okay, I'll do, I can, you know, get out of here and then advocate back to, you know, the people inside, but I at least know how, how the process works and the, the, you know, the organizations within government. And so then I jumped, but that was a kind of this personal meeting people over time, showing up, I would show up, I showed up to maybe like a few of their events at different places and, you know, and talk to them afterwards and sort of like starting to build up. You know, and oh, and I sent them. I had published in a couple of journals at the end of my at the end of my graduate program on the issues um, that were are on this same theme. I sent them my the journal articles. I did that, so that you know that did help too, because it was sort of like, hey, I have a I have a body of knowledge. It may be academic knowledge, not real like how this is working in practice. Um, and, you know, and I, then I have some knowledge of how the inner workings of the Pentagon and so forth work. So that, that uh, yeah, so it just sometimes things happen this way. Do you think it could be the opposite? Could you go from NGO to government? Oh, yeah, I know lots of people do that as well. And, and people go from NGO to the UN. Like, so here's another, this is another kind of system that operates, right? Like, I did advocacy with the UN for a number of years, and it's like in New York, you know, you have all these NGOs, and they're going back and forth into the UN Secretariat, and they're attending meetings, and they're giving presentations, and all this stuff's happening. And I knew a number of people from the NGO community that ended up then going to work in the UN. There's a lot of back and forth there, um, and there, there certainly, I think with government, with US government, there's particular challenges. Um, I think that, um, and this comes back to like you did a, a program, you know, that you found helpful for the futures, what you were mentioning. Um, sometimes those established programs are really good entry points, um, not only to networking and to your next thing, um, but they can also be entry points into places like these big larger bureaucracies, right? So with the U.S. government in particular, um, it's it's been very, it's now very difficult to get in unless you go through certain routes. Yeah. And one of those routes is like a fellowship called the Presidential Management Fellowship Program, which is what I came in. You have to have had, gotten your graduate degree. Okay. It, they only accept people with graduate degrees. And then you can go, you can apply and get in. And it puts you in immediately into the middle level of government rather than the intern level. So you're immediately, like, you're given a responsibility of someone who's, you know, been in there a while. So, yeah, so that's another. So there's all kinds of programs out there. So that's the other thing in ter terms of mapping institutions. You also have to kind of look at these various programs that are out there because they're a great way. They're a great way to get in. Plus, then you meet others in the cohort, and that becomes, you know, a lot of your peer group when you help each other. So. Yeah. I was just hoping you could speak in the last two minutes okay. to uh, what you are doing here at yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> we can have another conversation about that. Um, yeah, so here what I am mainly focused on um, is UC Davis right now, we're really, really international. We do a lot of stuff that's international. It's very, it tends to be very disconnected, right? Because it's based on like what Professor X or Y is doing their collaborations and their research and so forth. Um, and so it's always this balance, right? It needs to be decentralized and everyone owns their stuff, but at the same time, we kind of need to be able to like, let's scale some of this or let's support it more and so forth. So we're sort of trying to figure that out. And one of the things we're trying to figure out is whether UC Davis should have any offices in other countries. So to facilitate, right, all these things going on. And it would be really helpful, like, as I, I think, I may make an assumption, you tell me, but, like, if, you know, as you all leave your programs and go out to wherever you do, if you're going to another country and living there, it would be nice to have some place where there's events and there's, you know, there's alumni, you know, and all this stuff. So the question is, you know, where? Do we start? What does this look like? So we've been in this whole process of kind of the outward looking. We do a lot of bilateral partnerships, tons and tons and tons of them with different institutions. 
But you know, where would it make sense for us to perhaps have a like a little presence that would assist graduate students who want to do research, that would assist professors who want to, you know, that we could do remote teaching, that there could be different things that we could do. So we're 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 grappling with that. And it's a process. And so what we're doing initially is we UC Davis has an office in Chile, mm -hmm. the life sciences. And we're hoping that we would first expand that because we're already there. Um, and because the, the life sciences, the current center is limited in what it can do, obviously has to be connected with life sciences. So we can do so much more, law, all these different things if we expand. So we're looking at that um, and we're looking at how we might be able to do more on the ground in Mexico. And we're looking at Africa. Um, because, um, also because the other UCs have established offices in Africa, and we can take advantage of those. So, you know, um, we're, we're looking at those kind of like low-hanging fruit to start and then kind of see what, what develops. And so that's a big part of what I'm doing. We're also doing a strategic plan for the entire campus. Um, for I mean, we have a strategic plan for the entire campus called to boldly go, an international strategic plan for the entire campus. So I really hope that Janice probably has a list of all of you, but hopefully you all will provide input into that because this will be really really important if you care about what UC Davis does internationally. It's going to be important for you when you become alumni as well. So all these things are a little bit more like a strategic stuff we're thinking through. And the third thing we're doing that might be really of interest is we're trying to figure out how UC Davis can engage more regularly on the UN Sustainable Development Goals. So there's a lot of work happening. You know, those 17 goals encompass pretty much anything. Um, but there's a lot of work happening around campus on, on that, that is contributing to that. But we don't necessarily make the connection between that research and teaching and what policymakers are struggling with around it. And we could use the UN Sustainable Development Goals as a vehicle, as a frame yeah. to tie that to policymaking a little bit more. So that may provide a lot of opportunity. So I would urge you also to think about that with the work that you're all doing in your fields, your research. How does it tie in with the Sustainable Development Goals? Because this isn't going away. Universities are finally, slowly getting on board. I would say UC Davis is ahead of many of them on recognizing, oh boy, we're really strong on this stuff. We need to do something. Um, so the more you can tie it to there, and then that's, an, that's a, like a very clear way to then engage on, on the policy side. So those are some of the big things. So we're chewing on some yeah. of these things, but we we'll absolutely love your input. Um, and Janice, uh, get, share my email you can find me on the global affairs website um, but i welcome your perspectives and your input at any point of what we can do because um we're now is the time of formulating it so yeah anything else anyone has any uh i i have like a little comment question uh yeah. regarding um her question so i i think that we we are kind of like in the campus there are people interested in in you know increasing the impact of our research uh, through policy or government advice what i don't feel uh for example at my level that i'm not faculty i don't feel the support so i think that we kind of need okay. a unit that yeah. legitimizes our interest yeah yeah because if, if you are the pi of a student that yes. is uh, taking time from the right research like right. how can we legitimize this commitment to something different yes yes yeah, so we need to like embed this right more as, as something that's uh, it's a long process. It's a change know. of philosophy it's, for PIs. Changing philosophy, changing incentive structures, changing all this is going to take a while. But I think the more it comes from multiple sources, you know that actually you all have power because I think there's you know if it's sort of like student grad students are asking. I mean, I think it's already shifting just in terms of here, we're, we're working on a global learning hub. And, and there's a lot of talk about like, everyone needs more, wants more, is demanding more experiential learning, is demanding access to internships and ex, externships. Your voices do have power. 
Um, you know, and so, you know, the whole, the whole thing is a house of cards if the graduate students are such a, an integral piece of it. Um, so I think that it is going to take a while to change, but this is where, I mean, same as government and doing advocacy, we find our champions. You know, we build our champions inside and then it kind of starts to spread. Not that there's not going to be roadblocks and challenges there, for sure, but the more I think that if there are ways for us to create, I think, channels for you all to voice that on the international side and what you need, definitely when this international strategic plan, we're going to have the, the website and it's going to be like, please provide your comments in there. We need your voices to be heard because I can tell you as a person who's pretty new to this institution in higher education, the decisions are dominated by the same faculty who show up to things and are on the committees and so forth. And it's not going to reflect what you all need you know, necessarily. So these opportunities, when they create the platform, you can just get on there like multiple times and put everything in there because they're going to be looking at it. They have to look at it. So, yeah, so I think that we, um, I think it's just so important. And as we go forward in global affairs, I think there's a real, there's a mandate to actually support more. And there, there's definitely a lot of interest in the work being done on how can we how can we nurture and support um, these experiences and, and you know and this bridging to the next step for for students right for grad students and, and undergrad students and uh, so we we need the input for sure yeah yeah but there's I think there's real openness from global affairs to hear that so yeah so please do keep and, and anything. Yeah, anything. I'm happy. I have an open door. I'm happy to hear anything. And if you have ideas also for the international front and like if UC Davis has offices, what what would help if you had an if there was an office somewhere if you're doing international research and so forth. So yeah, yeah. Because we can't just like sit here and know what the issues are and what the challenges are. We need to hear from you all so that we can address it. So, thank you. 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 Thank are you finishing this quarter? That's the goal. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so cool. yeah, no, I am. I have my exam set up for the May 22nd. Assuming I pass half. Yeah. Um, yeah. Are you a yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I was just here earlier. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I was in Sierra Leone in the fall. So that's why I took that research methods yeah. nutrition class, because I needed okay. to learn about research methods, and my class had like nothing to do with yeah. nutrition, but I was yeah. like, I just yeah. really need to understand how this works. So, yeah, so I ended up. I was in Sierra Leone until November. Yeah. 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 And then I had that last quarter in this quarter, kind of writing that up as a thesis. I, I mean, I'm sort of like yeah. cramming oh, a bunch of classes last year. year. So, yeah. 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 How long have you been doing that? I've been doing a couple of years. Have you been doing all of the political science stuff? No, I'd love to be. And I had reached out when I first moved out here um, about, like, could I, you know, can I do anything for the political science students and I didn't yeah. I didn't get much in response and I, I actually ended up teaching um, for two years at Sac State in their political science oh. department. I oh. taught national security there. Oh, that's awesome. um, but I didn't do it this 